G'day guys, welcome back to True Footy and the Football Come Down, a weekly show where we unpack the weekend of football. Good week of semis, I must admit. I think they were better than I was expecting. I was sort of expecting every final so far to be great, and as was the feedback on the first weekend, we kind of thought the games themselves weren't that engaging other than, you know, one result, the, the Sydney Derby. And while there were good narratives, we didn't really have too many classic games. Just one out of four were really good. And this weekend, both games lived up and were absolute thrillers. In different circumstances, one was an arm wrestle pretty much throughout, and the second one was what was it, the second best finals comeback in the history of our game. So, as always, I'll be responding to your comments on the round, and we'll get straight into it. We've got some general comments to start off this video, and then we'll get into the games specifically. Samantha Jane says, some pretty average umpiring, some absolute howlers. In the end, two really close, albeit controversial finals. My dream of a completely non-Victorian grand final is one step closer. And that all depends on Geelong, uh, you know, losing, obviously. As for the umpiring, I thought that, I don't think I really re remembered too much in the second semi-final. We're about 24 hours removed now. In the first one, Port Adelaide versus Hawthorne, I do think Hawthorne benefited from some calls that I would prefer not to have been paid. And they there was a few that went Hawthorne's way in a row. But in the end, it wasn't them who prevailed anyway, but fair enough. Sean Christie says, two cracking games. Hawks will be kicking themselves when they should be kicking goals. And Brisbane got out of jail. G GWS will be saying WTF just happened. And we'll be doing some soul searching. Absolutely. We're going to go into more depth about GWS. But you'd have to say that is one of the biggest finals chokes as, as far as the final series goes it'd be actually worth going back i think for a video and having a look to see what other straight sets exits have been bigger chokes i, I doubt you'd find one to be honest considering the lead in both games ozate says the giants went out in straight sets in the finals this year brisbane making it to a prelim after finishing fifth at the end of the home and away season was a big surprise they pulled a carlton from 2023 except that they beat carlton in an elimination final I can see a Sydney versus Brisbane Grand Final. Sydney Brisbane Grand Final would be cool because we've never seen it before. I agree. I'm kind of kind of hoping that is the outcome. And it wasn't so long ago those two teams played in a ripping game at the Gabba. Spin Doctor says individual performances really stood out. Rioli dominated with clean, composed disposals under pressure. Will Ashcroft stepped up when Brisbane looked cooked. Second week of finals delivered what the first week couldn't. Absolutely, we'll get more into individuals as we get through the game, but you could highlight Jace Burgoyne as well. Um, Joe Danaher, of course, in the second game. There's a few to mention, but I agree. Rioli in particular was so clean in a game that was otherwise a very hot potato. Some dude says, RIP, the Swans v Giants rematch grand final would have been a good game. Yeah, I've mentioned it so many times, but the Sydney GWS was my predicted grand final at the start of the year, and I was going for that so I could look back and say, wow, I've done a great job of predicting that, but the dream is dead. Geelong probably prefers to play Brisbane over GWS at the MCG. I was thinking that as well. We, a lot remains to be seen. We've been surprised in finals before, but I do think that Brisbane, well, they've played Geelong in two prelims, I reckon. Did they play them in 2020 in a prelim? And they played them in 2022 in a prelim, and I think, well, I'm certain Geelong smashed them both times. Only one of those with the MCG. I agree. That being said, even if Brisbane had just gotten close to beating the Giants and fallen just short... I still probably wouldn't have had a lot of confidence in the Giants given, you know, the way they've finished both games. Swans need to break their eight-year loss streak against Port Adelaide now. Absolutely. No better time to do it, really. And no idea which team will win this year. But personally hoping for a Swans-Brisbane grand final as they haven't met one. Uh, yeah, that's correct. They haven't. Geelong and Port have obviously met in one. Geelong and Sydney have obviously met in one. And Port and Brisbane have as well. So this is the only combination that uh, would be a first-time grand final matchup. Boomerstar says this final series is really highlighting how important individual performances are come finals time. Agreed. Look at Heaney versus GWS, Danaher and Ashcroft versus GWS, Rioli versus Hawthorne, and even Stengel, Manor, and Myers versus Port, although I think the Port one was kind of a team domination, but I agree with your point. They all stood out and helped their respective sides win. Keith Minchin says, watch till the end and don't assume the game is over at three-quarter time. OMG. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, even with eight minutes to go on the live stream, me and Rogi were both doubling down and saying, surely the Giants win from here. I think Keith had a shot on goal that missed, but had it been a goal, I do think that would have been the end of the Lions' resistance, maybe. Samuel Calamaris says, depressed. Not sure if you're a Hawks fan or a Giants fan, uh, but I'd imagine Giants fans probably have more to be miserable about this weekend. But anyway, let's get into the semi-final specifically. So Port Adelaide defeat Hawthorne by three points in an engaging semi-final. You could tell from pretty early on there was a response from Port Adelaide, and that probably should have been the minimum expectation. But 
of course, we, we can't forget so many people wrote them off and even I lost confidence in them. They were my predicted premier at the start of the final series that got obliterated with their first final loss to the Cats by 84 points. Now, we probably sold them short writing them off, but there's also, you know, coming up against the Hawthorne side that hasn't really taken a backward step for some time. But from very, very early on, you could sense the pressure and the intent and the, uh, the tackling intensity of Port Adelaide was the difference between the two sides and arguably could have put themselves a little bit further in front and a little bit of luck from Hawthorne. I won't harp on about that, but a couple of, you know, dangerous tackles and a ball that went out of bounds but, but wasn't paid out of bounds that resulted in a Hawthorne goal, that kind of kept the minutes. But to Hawthorne's credit, when they stayed in touch, they really started to get the game more on their terms in the second half. I think their composure really improved. And again, young side playing in their second final against a team whose defensive efforts and pressure towards the back end of the home and away season were very strong. Port Adelaide brought that to this game. Hawthorne struggled a little bit with their composure in the first half. I felt they really worked their way into the game in the second half and did kind of look like they might pinch the game from Port Adelaide. At the end of the day, it was only three points in the end. But well done to Port Adelaide. I... I would have been happy with either winner in this scenario. Um, you know, Hawthorne continuing their narrative would have been awesome. At the end of the day, I don't think it's a big deal in the scheme of things that they lost this game. I mean, how could you really place two harsher expectations on a group that well and truly exceeded everyone's expectations this season, even from round seven onward? And for Port Adelaide, I'm, I'm kind of, honestly, I feel a bit of empathy for their fans after that first final. You know, you put yourself in a great position to win the premiership. They legitimately were slash are. To produce that in the first final, I think their fans deserve so much better. So I'm pleased for them that they were able to bring that intensity to this game and execute. And you've got to give them a chance next week, but we'll get to that. A few other individuals for them. We saw Jace Bergwijn have his best game at AFL level. You know, I think at the start of the year, I remember looking at Port Adelaide's best 22 and not really knowing anything about Jace Bergwijn. From what I understand, he's had a fairly good year. This, this was the first time I really noticed him as being outstanding. And what a final to produce your best career game. Uh, Logan Evans has also played really well in recent times. I thought he was very impactful in this game. And a lot has been said about Willy Rioli. I do remember a specific moment he grabs the ball and in half a second just hits someone on the, uh, on the handball. And I can't remember for the life of me who it was now, but I feel like it might have been Burton that nailed the goal. I mean, 48 hours removed from the game now, and I've forgotten who actually kicked the goal. But it was particularly outstanding given how clean he was in a game that otherwise was not very clean. Georgiatis was huge up forward. Charlie Dixon was a laid out from memory, but Georgiatis looked like the difference between the two sides early doors. With uh, He ended up kicking three goals. Horn Francis was really good in the clinches. Zach Butters obviously carrying some ribs. Um, well, he's always carrying ribs, but in particular this week they were quite sore. Um, but he laid eight tackles, and while he probably didn't dominate by any stretch, I think... He's definitely made an impact. So we'll get to some comments here. Tiger Walker says, the power is still in contention with the flag, considering the fact that they haven't lost to the Swans in eight years. I, have, I think that's, that's very true. I do think they will be hoping they don't play Geelong in a grand final because, well, I think that's kind of obvious. Uh, Roman Talk Chick says, Port Adelaide are still undeniably alive. Agreed. Boomer Star says, reality was the difference between Port and Hawthorne and could be again in a week's time against Sydney. His composure, cleanliness with the ball, outstanding in the first half. And if Port didn't have Rioli, I don't think Port would be in a prelim final. I agree with that. I think it's a fair assessment. But again, I would extend that to a few other individuals. Um, you know, Logan Evans was fantastic in defense. Jace Bergwijn and Georgiatis was great in the air as well. So there was a few that stood out, but agreed. When In a game of inches like that, you know, if Rioli doesn't hit that hand pass, maybe this game finishes differently. Shadow Light says, Hawks had every reason to win, yet couldn't convert at most, at the most crucial of times. That's true, late in the game, I think Sicily kicked one goal too, didn't he? But equally, earlier in the game, I think Port probably left a few on the board as well. Ray says, Nick Watson will be the best small forward in the AFL one day. Special speed, agility, tackling, goal sense, and at his best when the, light, uh, the lights are brightest. It's hard to argue with that. He's delivering in finals as well in his first season and a little bit lucky, I suppose, to come into a team that is functioning well. Would he be playing this well at West Coast? Probably not. That being said, the talent was undeniable pre-draft and it's still undeniable. undeniable. And you, you also, as you say, we see this in finals. He's going to have an amazing career. Sam Robinson says Hawks aren't finals ready and Camville says Hawks suck. Harsh takes. I think Camville is a Hawks fan that's obviously disappointed. They obviously don't suck. As for being finals ready, I think they, they well, when you say that, it kind of implies that they couldn't lift the occasion. Well, they won a final and they were very close to winning a second one against a team that was very committed and had a lot to play for. I mean, all finals are like that, but I don't think they did themselves any injustice. 
Let's talk a little bit about the Ken Hinckley situation because we got a huge chunk of comments about what happened between Ken Hinckley and uh, Jack Ginevan and, of course, James Sicily as well. Now, we've got a variety of comments on both sides of the argument, so I'll just read them out. Spin Doctor says, People lose their minds when Ginevan does anything. Imagine a grown man getting triggered by a tweet. There is such a thing as being a bad winner. Ginevan has more class than Hinckley and something Hinckley will <laughs> never have, a premiership. Shadow Light says, Hinckley saved his job yet didn't save face and ultimately painted a bigger target on his back. Santos says, how can Hawk rip, rip the shit all year and then act like babies when they cop it some their way? It looks so weak and gutless. Went from being admired to a laughing stock in one game and it had nothing to do with the loss. Darth Jar Jar says Hawks can give it but can't take it. G-Bags says Jack Edivan's comment shows that karma is a bitch, coming from a Hawks fan. Play on footy says Hinkley got his emotions the better of him. I know what you're trying to say. Zelma Zam says Ken did nothing wrong. So a real mix of comments here and I must admit, I kind of disagree and agree with everyone at the same time. So my personal take on it, I think you have to go back to Jack Ginnivan to start off with. Now, I'm not going to lie to you. I don't particularly like Jack Ginnivan. I don't hate the kid at all. I don't have hate in my heart, but he's not the sort of character that I kind of enjoy. And, you know, if you were to rank the 800 AFL players from 1 to 800 of who I'd want to have a beer with, Jack Ginnivan would probably rank pretty low. However, however, I also don't think Ginnivan really did much wrong this week and it was in the headlines multiple times. So two specific things. First of all, he commented on, was it Instagram or Twitter or whatever, saying, see you in 14 days to the Sydney Swans. Am I the only one that thinks that is quite a vanilla piece of banter? Like I don't interpret that as arrogance or disrespecting Port Adelaide. I do wonder if Port Adelaide hadn't lost by 84 points, would they have taken that comment to so much to heart? I think it was vanilla. It was not particularly funny, but lighthearted and got blown out of proportion. Second of all, you know, the whole pub thing, like, give me a spell. He can't have a meal at a venue just because it primarily serves alcohol the night before a game. He's not even drinking alcohol. This is all just clicks and engagement. I get it. Now, going back to the, the comment about seeing you in 14 days, that caused a ripple. Um, I, I, again, like I said, I think it's an overreaction. That being said, Ken Hinckley, I believe it's being said that, you know, he put it up on the board that week to try and motivate Port Adelaide and say, you know, we've got to beat these guys and prove them wrong. We've been disrespected. Again, that's good coaching. Do I think he should have taken it to heart? No. But at the end of the day, Port Adelaide are coming off a tough week to ground their focus in revenge and trying to motivate them. I'm all for that. And I think that's fair enough. But when the final siren goes, it is clear that Ken Hinckley took it too much to heart, in my opinion. But there's so much nuance to this because, again, I don't want to demonize Ken Hinckley. He didn't go up and abuse Ginevan. On the other hand, I agree it's not the best conduct after you've beaten a team in a semi-final and they're still processing the loss to go up and antagonize. So I think it's a little bit of both here. Ken hasn't done a whole lot wrong, but it is a poor look. And I've seen he's been fined $20,000, which is... Isn't that the same as what Clarkson got fined for saying what he said? $20,000 is steep, but I do think is a bit of an overreaction to Ken Hinckley's conduct here. Did he behave particularly well? No. And I also don't blame Sicily for firing up because, again, we've just lost a heartbreaking semi-final and you go into bat for a younger player. Again, I, I kind of respect Sicily for firing up. It's just that this whole thing is blown out of proportion here. So in summary, Hinckley probably took Ginevan's uh, tweet too much to heart. I don't think it was particularly disrespectful. I think it was lighthearted vanilla banter. It was essentially saying, yeah, we're going to win this week. Like, of course, a player is going to think that. I don't think he's the worst bloke in the world for, you know, going up and saying something to Ginevan. I do think he shouldn't have, but he's not, you know, an evil person for doing so. It was just a misstep. Equally, Hawthorne went into bat for their player. Fair enough. I think it's just been blown out of proportion. Anyway, let's move to the second semifinal. So the Giants played the Brisbane Lions and um, what a game this was. You know, it was looking a little bit of a fizzer for, uh, I think early in the third quarter, it started to trend in a way where you felt like the game had more or less been sewn up. I think that's fair to say. Jujita Burst were playing well. Jesse Hogan was playing outstanding. And now the, the most goals ever in a season by a GWS player, surpassing Jeremy Cameron a couple of years ago, or four years ago, or it was 2019, I think it was. Um, so a lot was going right. Sure enough, Brisbane get a couple goals in a row. I remember it got to 44 points in the third quarter. Brisbane get a couple of goals, and suddenly, very quickly, the momentum of the game had changed. Brisbane were running on top of the field. GWS suddenly became very reactive and generally with a second to the ball, and 
Brisbane were able to score very, very quickly. It was quite alarming how quickly Brisbane were able to get on top and score easily. And I've seen some analysis of the game looking back because at the time, probably a little bit distracted on the stream, but you know, I think they were pointing to evidence that GWS had sort of gone into their shells and were trying to defend their lead far too early. You do wonder as well, the psychological impact of losing a big lead last week, did that creep into the players here? Did they become too timid? Either way, there were multiple fightbacks in this game. I think Brisbane, you know, they kicked five in a row, I think. But with say eight minutes to go, as I said earlier in this video, I think Lockie keeps lining up for goal. It was 100 plays 80, and he kicks that goal, and the game's pretty much won. And even though I think it was either a point or no, it must have been no score, even though he didn't score a goal, it still looked very much against the odds that Brisbane would win. But nonetheless, they fight back, you know, there's a, I think in particular, Brisbane were very good at defending aerially, and there's no surprise that Harris Andrews was a big factor in this game, but GWS just couldn't get any meaningful ball. They would bomb it long, and there would be a one-on-one -on -one contest, and a Brisbane defender, whether it be Andrews or someone else, would either mark it or spoil it, and GWS just couldn't get any momentum going. And then Brisbane suddenly became very clinical. At one point, there were six goals, 14. But suddenly after that, they started nailing all of them. And I suppose that's the clutchness and composure piece that probably comes from playing in a whole stack of finals now. But sure enough, yep, yeah, Brisbane fight back again. Joe Danaher, absolutely clutch goal. Again, you can almost bet that when the game's there to be won, a guy who is typically very erratic in front of goal, there seems to be a psychological switch with him where he nailed not one, but two really clutch goals. The one from, you know, outside the boundary, that one was probably better, but I think the second one, albeit while it was closer, it was probably difficult for his kicking arc and also, you know, probably a little bit more tense given it would have given them the lead. So anyway, massive credit to a number of individuals here. It wasn't just Danaher. I thought McCluggage, I was commenting throughout the game, his composure and class. I, I felt like there was a number of times he appeared to run himself into trouble, but was able to steady and look inboard and find someone, even though there was two Giants players bearing down on him. Didn't look rattled at all. I think his composure was huge. Will Ashcroft similarly again. I think this kid is built for finals. Jared Berry as well, again, like Lockie Neal didn't have a big game, but all those other Brisbane midfielders stood up. And Danaher as well, obviously, you know, put it on the scoreboard, their dominance. So Brisbane came home with a wet sail and uh, GWS will be ruining that one for some time. Let's get straight to the comments, there's heaps. AFL Snap says, Brisbane 44 point, point comeback, enough said. Yeah, like I said, second best ever finals comeback. And I think the first one was in 1931. Uh, G-Bag says, Will Ashcroft's performance shows that he can be a superstar in the future. Agreed, he's got that Dacos slash Sheasel kind of vibe where, you know, rising to the level, the moment feels irrelevant to him. I mean, was that that's, must be his second final, right? Because it is ACL last year. For him to step up and perform, you know, that's, um, well, it's something Brisbane didn't have last year in the finals. Shadow Light says, Lions went from sleeping to creeping to outright stealing of the win and credit to them in what was a clutch win they had no rights to. Des Benson says, Cam Rayner needs to lift. Coming from a Brisbane fan, when he's up and about, we always win games. Need him getting all the ball to win premierships. That's true. Rayner's not a very high volume sort of player, but he does step up in big moments and you can kind of back him in when the game's there to be won to grab the ball and, and roost it from 50 or take a screamer but he might have 12 possessions. He's just sort of that kind of player. But in big games like that, those players are worth their weight in gold. Adam says, I'm still in shock and disbelief after the Lions just did that. I'm a Lions fan. It was unreal. Leon King, Brisbane might pick for the premiership now. I think they can expose the Cats midfield, heaps of finals experience and all the motivation in the world. You can't discount them. And their last uh, game at the MCG, or well, the last final was the grand final and they nearly beat Collingwood there. So there's no real reason that they shouldn't be able to make a good account of themselves in a prelim against Geelong. Now, as for the midfield thing, Brisbane's midfield is fantastic. It was, again, I think too good for GWS from memory. They were smashing them in clearances by the end of it, or at least they were while they were, you know, sort of dominating. But Geelong's midfield is not to be underrated. You know, I think um, they beat Port Adelaide in their own game last week. And I think at the back end of the season, Geelong's midfield has really taken um, its game to the next level. So... It'll be a tough game, but they're not without their chances. Charles Atkinson says, the Brisbane Lions aren't going down without a fight. Porter, a real chance to challenge Sydney. Also, Will Ashcroft and Kai Lohman are Brisbane's future. I also thought Jasper Fletcher was pretty good in this game. I don't know how many stats he ended up with, but again, impactful and a couple of good handballs. And there's two Ashcrofts, there's a Fletcher, there's a Kai Lohman. The, the future is looking bright. Santos says, after some of the most forgiving finals runs choked by the Lions in recent years, they look most likely to do it the hard way this year. That's a very fair point. I mean, early days when they didn't have a lot of finals experience, 
I think like 2019 through 21 maybe, um, Brisbane were probably blowing good positions in terms of their finals fixture. I tell you what, if they beat the Cats to make the grand final next week, it would easily be the best finals run um, in, well, since the last premiership. JDB says Brisbane could win it all. Christopher Doolan says big goofy Joe Danaher boots two clutch goals to pull off a miracle comeback. Go Lions. And Leo King says Eric Hipwood needs to be dropped. He's a liability out there. Play Morris and Danaher. And then just the small forwards who are the best in the comp. Yeah, the smalls are going pretty well at the moment. I did have a look at uh, Hipwood's stats. So he had seven disposals in this game at only 57% efficiency, one goal, one. And he's only kicked six, uh, three goals in the last six weeks. That is, um, that is quite damning. Again, you know, the structure piece is 200 something centimeters tall. Are they willing to experiment with their structure and how they line up? in a prelim final when, you know, they've just won two finals and generally been a very good team now since about round seven. Maybe. I, I think it's a fair observation anyway, Leo. Talking everything AFL says the Giants choked. Lachlan Gaming says Giants, Giants can't win close games. Well, I think at the end of the home and away season, they didn't... Well, they came from behind to beat Hawthorne. They held off Fremantle. So it's, I don't think it's a close game thing, but... Naga says, I will never back GWS in a final series ever again. It will haunt the GWS forever. Yeah, I mean, the narrative that I've been perpetuating, but is also true, is that they've been a good finals team that deliver in the big moments. And I do wonder if there's going to be any fallout from this next year where they suddenly lack in confidence in finals. I don't know. I don't know. We're 12 months away from them even playing in a final now. Leon King says, want to shout out Cal Ward. Absolutely huge in trying to get his team over the line. Yes. Again, very clutch player. And uh, again, was kicked a late goal against Sydney, didn't he? I agree, he is a warrior. Archie says, GWS is one of the strongest teams to go out in straight sets. They had Sydney on the ropes of the SCG. Despite choking hard, they had uh, they Brisbane well beaten until halfway through the third. Their only problem seems to be their match fitness. Fix that up and they'll be in contention next year. I'm not sure if it's a fitness issue. Like It's, it's a worthy question because of the way they're fading out of games, but... They did come from behind to beat Hawthorne that, not that long ago. I think this might be psychological, to be honest. Boomer Star says, Giants can't hold a lead. But also, Will Ashcroft could be the missing piece to Brisbane from last year. He had 27 disposals, 14 contested, 10 score involvements, 5 marks, 5 tackles, and 9 clearances. Well said. I actually didn't realize that was the stats profile of his game. I knew that he was one of the best, but you know that's very impressive. 10 score involvements. And you're right, a missing piece from last year's grand final team. And finally, Clark Clement says that the Giants are just as unlucky as Melbourne last year. Two years in a row that the best team in the comp went out in straight sets. This is a big call. I don't feel that either of Melbourne or GWS were the best teams. I don't think GWS really earned that mantle. They finished fourth. They lost the final against Sydney. I suppose they got in front. I suppose it's hard to also pick a contender for who would be the other best team because there's been a question mark on every single team. It might even just be Geelong right now. Also, I don't know about Melbourne last year. But anyway, you've had your say. Anyway, guys, thank you for tuning into the football come down. Once again, there's only two of these left for the rest of the season. So keep an eye out for, I've got trade predictions coming out very soon. I have got just the tips again this weekend and a whole variety of other content coming. So make sure you subscribe to the channel. I appreciate you watching and I'll see you in the next one. Cheers.